All right, so uh, just to kind of jump right in, um, what metrics should we actually be paying attention to? Because I know a lot of us kind of focus on like MAUs and DAUs and all that kind of stuff, so. Um. You're the expert. <laughs> so I think it depends on, frankly, where you are in your maturity as an app developer or publisher, um, and frankly, what hat you wear. For, for smaller publishers that are, or let's say developers that are introducing their first app, Frankly, a lot of the store rankings are critical, right? So where are you ranked? What do the downloads look like? How's monetization? How are you comparing to your peers, um, let's say, within your same category? Um, but as you start to mature a bit, you need a lot more information. And this is where we can talk about MAUs, DAOs, WOWs, right? Um, I think there's obviously been a lot of attention put on monthly average users. And it's, it is an important metric, but in a vacuum, it doesn't mean that much, right? So if you're, let's say, the type of app that um, it's more about frequency than duration, then think about something like you know, an Uber, right? And it's, you want to have as many transactions as possible. A lot of commerce type apps would fall into that category. Social apps and communications apps would fall in that category. If you're a game developer or a game publisher, on the other hand, maybe it's not so much about, you know, frankly, the, uh, the, the, the uh, number of visits, as an example, or the number of uh, engagements, but more about the total duration of engagement with your app. Um, and I guess the other piece I'd add before sort of closing on that is, you know, when we work with different types of customers, it, they wear different hats, right? So you have folks on the product side that are actually developing the application, and they may want to really understand, you know, if they're, you know, relative to A-B testing, right? If they highlight different aspects of the app description, does that drive or hinder downloads? Obviously, things like price changes and, and, this, and so forth can change um, how a company ranks or how well they do. Um, but if you're more of into user acquisition, right, you want to understand which other ads maybe have similar audience to you so that you can cross-promote and attract those users over to your game or your app, et cetera. So, you know, from the product side, from the user acquisition side, um, from more of a marketing um, side, there's multiple hats that I think, depending on who you are within one of these publishers or developers, the metrics really can vary that help you determine if you're being successful. And so as an investor, like, how does this influence your decisions, I guess? So I think, so I want to echo what Daniel said. Like, no, the metrics are... Uh, they're not the same for each company. And I think a lot of, when, I, when companies come and pitch us about their mobile app, and they tend to have a set package of metrics they think are important. And those are high level metrics, and those, those are important. But I, we always push back and ask sort of the founder and the person who's designing the product, what are you optimizing for? What are the metrics that show that you, your consumers that are using your app really engage with the app and love your app and you're, what metrics are you looking at to make sure that you continue to have that trend? And so I think the different companies will have different metrics that they're going to look, look at, and that's fine. And I well, think so understanding case, that then, is important. If that's the case, then, you know, when WhatsApp was bought, the massive focus was on, like, oh, like, how much did Facebook pay per MAU, per DAU? What, what were we missing there? You weren't missing anything. It's just a it's a high level view of how to think about the the business. But look, I mean, the reason why WhatsApp is valuable is it had super high engagement. Um, I think a lot of the metrics have been out there that the sort of user base that they have and the number of the, how quickly and how often they use it is 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 just phenomenal. And I talked to my partner Jim Getz yesterday about some of the metrics. The one thing that's shocking is most companies they're sort of MAU to download, uh, daily active users to monthly active users, they tend to sort of get to a level and they taper off at some percentage that seems good, not good, great, whatever that app is. And for WhatsApp, that, that, those percentages kept increasing over time, which is very, very rare to see. Okay. Um, so based on all of this, you know, all of these sort of underlying metrics that are there. Um, are there any lessons we can kind of learn from Secret, um, which, you know, had an extraordinary amount of buzz? Um, obviously, there was something going on under the hood that we weren't paying attention to, maybe. Um, you know, what is, you know, what are some lessons that we can learn there? Well, I don't, I don't know anything about Secret specifically. We're investors in Whisper, uh, and they seem to be doing fairly well. And I think one of the things they focused on when I was talking talking to Michael Hayward yesterday, is, the, um, is their focus on engagement. And the metric they, they care about is on if today a user comes back, 
comes and uses the app to get it today, what percentage of those users use the app five out of the last seven days? And so he said that it's okay to disclose this. It's 50%. That's a pretty high engagement level. That a user today was around the last five out of seven days. It wasn't like just today or yesterday. It's the last five out of seven days, and that's a pretty that's a longer window that than some people are willing to look at. It speaks to why mouths are not enough, right? Because if they're using it infrequently, they'll show up in the mouth, but that's not a good indication of engagement for that type of app. Is this something that just found some founders are not paying attention to, or? Well, I, I don't. I, I think different founders should pay attention to different things. If you're a commerce company, you care about the cohort and how fast they churn, uh, because if they don't come back uh, month after month and after month to spend, that's not good. But they don't need to come back every day. They can come back once a month, so long as they get value out of it and they're willing to pay, that's fine. So, like for Uber, for example, like what what are some of the metrics that? show that to be a really, I mean, it's a company that's worth tens of billions of dollars, right? <laughs> I mean, when I, when I think about what would be success, or what kind of metrics to watch, is, you know, maybe because you're benchmarking as a, as a competitor or what have you, um, or you're in some other sort of space that's also about sort of that conversion of the, the digital world to the physical world. Um, it's, you know, Mao to me is definitely secondary. Do you want to look at the rate of downloads to get a sense for how that install base is growing? Sure. But as soon as you start looking at monetization, to me it's about sort of number of sessions. And so whether that's a function of looking at it by, you know, to the point made a moment ago about um, Whisper, like is it about X number of visits per month or, or using the app a certain number of times, right? Because that's an indirect correlation. There's obviously a ratio to if I'm using this app at certain frequency, I'm therefore generating revenue for that app, for that particular um, company, in this case, Uber. So to me, it's, it, it's about frequency being a, a top factor. I think beyond that, you want to start to look at you know, getting, frankly, more granular and understanding you know, how does it differ from an audience perspective? Are there certain demographics that are using it more versus less? And therefore, do you want to, you know, Uber's done a great job with partnering to get preloads, right? I mean, I live in San Francisco. When I was looking at you know, how to walk to here today, one of the things that popped up as an option to get here was Uber. I didn't have that as an option where I live, um, as an example. So those sort of preloads, right? So where do you want to prioritize based on geography, based on, you know, they're in the United app, they're in all these different places. Do you want to go into different places to attract sort of the next adjacent market of users? And so you might want to partner with something that caters to more of a, you know, a different demographic, whether it's less professional or whether it's, you know, more female than male or whatever those other demos are that they feel they need to expand into because maybe there's a level of saturation in certain geographies and certain demographics. Well, that's interesting just because, you know, for a company like Uber, they handle these preload deals and, you know, it seems like theoretically that would drive some success. And on the flip side, you have some other companies that, you know, do these kinds of preload deals. You know, Path has done this before and, not necessarily that successful, I guess. Yeah. So, um, you know, how how do you track this kind of stuff um, in terms of, you know, again, it kind of gets back to the sort of MAU argument, right? Is this, you know, are these strategies for some companies to sort of juicing these MAUs or? I mean, the notion of preloading isn't really new, right? We had it with PCs over the last, you know, 15 years, we'd call it, you know, in terms of having sort of, you know, crapware on your system. Um, preloading on, on phones can be a way to, you know, drive some monetization. Um, and my view of it is user acquisition is constantly evolving. And so in some cases, you want to market to similar audiences that use a different app. So you have a certain type of game, and there's similar demographics for you know, one music app versus another. And one of them correlates more highly to your core user base. So you're going to market you know, on Pandora versus um, an alternative you know, music service provider, or, um, or ditto on you know, some other form of entertainment or another uh, app. I think in the case of preloads, it's one more example of trying to get after a specific demographic or maybe a more cost-effective way to buy some share. The reality is that preloads don't necessarily mean that the people getting that device 
know, you know, about that app, its yeah. value proposition. Or the device is just terrible, I guess, and no one actually buys it. Or there could be an issue with the device, and then you don't even know if those installs were worth anything. And so I view it as it's just one more lever to play. It's, it's not organic, right? And so whenever something is inorganic, you're going to have a relatively low success rate for the most part. So you came from IDC. What's different about the data that App Annie has that was just really fascinating to you in respect to all of this information? So in my role at, at IDC, I led the teams that focused on mobility, which was broad. It was devices. It was apps. It was, you know, infrastructure and mobile service providers, carriers, et cetera. But it was, you know, consumer, digital media, entertainment, et cetera, um, and tons of information. But it was. It's different, right? With, with App Annie, um, we obviously have been known for having our store stats and analytics platform and our store intelligence, which is our paid um, service. As of today, um, some of you may have seen, uh, we acquired Mobidia. Um, we were already in beta on a usage product. This now accelerates that. We'll na we now have usage data across 60 countries, across iOS and Android. Um, and so now all of a sudden, the discussion and insights around apps and how we can ultimately help developers and publishers make more meaningful business decisions and investments can be much more strategic. It's beyond just downloads and monetization. If you get into usage, now when you think about retailers and so forth, they don't monetize, or Uber, and, and you know, these companies I've seen um, today, like v or Vive, who was here yesterday about you know, blowouts and so forth, like connecting that physical world with the digital world um, through the mobile app. They are not monetizing through the store, right? They're monetizing through that engagement through the app. And so to me, that's where usage becomes a whole new set of metrics that's absolutely critical so to what measuring if, success. And, and what if a company like Facebook, which is you know, probably connected to all of these apps that we're talking about, um, like what if they decide to get into, because I know Facebook bought Onavo not too long ago and you know, for any number of reasons, tracking the competition, things like that, right? They probably, whether they're working on it now or have access to it internally, you know, they, they have the data sitting there maybe to use it you know how does how do you guys think about that like going forward whether it's you know in terms of business or anything along those lines so i mean and i i knew the anavo guys before the acquisition as well i the at the end of the day, a lot of these companies, whether it's Yahoo buying Flurry or, or Facebook buying Onovo, um, and there's going to be more acquisition, these companies need more and more insight into how consumers are using various products. And Does Facebook use you guys? Uh, I don't know if they're publicly announced as a customer or not. I'll <laughs> leave it at that. Um, so, and, and just because they have a solution in-house doesn't mean they don't have a need for other third-party data. Because Onovo has a piece of it. Certainly, it's, I don't think it's the 60 markets that we now have um, available to customers. Um, and the other thing, too, I mean, why would Facebook have bought up? I mean, we can, <laughs> you might have some interesting ideas on this. I mean, my <laughs> attitude is they wanted to do multiple things, right? One is it's a great way to monitor what's happening in the app space from an M&A standpoint, right? Another thing is to, frankly, maybe limit how data is out there on their various apps, potentially. Um, and then the third piece, obviously, is just for them to do some of their own optimization based on collecting this information as well and sort of accelerate the type of app usage data that they, you know, they were limited to within their applications, and now they have a broader universe of data to pull from. So do you have any thoughts on this? I just, I just want to say, you know, we were using, the, using App Annie all the time, logging in almost daily to check on the app economy, and then we became shareholders of the company because we love the company so much. Um, so, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and my partner, Omar Homori, who sits on App Annie's board, sort of just posed this question. Like, App Annie basically has the credentials for all, most of the app developers like 80 or 90 percent of the app developers are the, the biggest apps out there. And they have those credentials for the app stores for both Apple and Google. And think about what that could become over time. It's pretty powerful. So when, when you're sort of looking at the, the kind of fundings that are coming out, um, you know, these valuations can sometimes be kind of extraordinary. We saw Zenefits um, announce their funding today at a four and a half billion dollar valuation, I think. Is it just because, you know, you guys have access to this data, to this information that really actually justifies these valuations? Or is it, you know, is it actually like FOMO and valuation creep and some of the other theories that are out there? Well, I think lots of people have different perspectives, and I think a lot of them, have, a lot of people have talked about whether we're in a bubble or not. I would just, th those things are, have been talked about. I would just say that half-lives of companies have gotten a lot shorter. Companies grow up a lot faster, they die a lot faster. And so we're going to see more of this going on. And so. 
I think the maturity, the speed at which companies mature are going to be faster. I think uh, usually you sort of want to get product market fit. You use App Annie. You, you sort of figure out what things are working for your consumer. Then you layer on uh, adver advertising and marketing, because advertising and marketing is basically pouring fuel on a fire that you've already created. And I think that's just getting a lot faster. So these companies are raising lots of money to try all sorts of different things in, in, in sales and marketing spectrum to sort of chase growth. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's great for the entrepreneurial spirit. It's great for the ecosystem. It's great to get companies started. And it's great for us to try all these different ideas. It doesn't lead to the best operating companies, though. And a lot of our, the companies that we've uh, worked with that have become long-term successes figure out how to start an inferno with a single match, as some of my partners would like to say. And then you layer on sort of the marketing spend and sur sort, of, sort of go from there. Um, and I think we've lost a little bit of that. And we'll see whether these companies of today will become great operating companies and enduring companies of the future. So you guys have access to all of this data, um, you know, how to actually track like, what makes a company successful. Um, what's your advice to Dick Costello right now? To D Dick Costello? Yeah. I don't think I know enough about his business. To, well, in to terms of like, you know, a little bit of stalling growth, like, you know, what would you, what advice would you give him in terms of like the kind of based on the information that you guys have? Uh, Dick's really smart. He has a good team. I'm sure they'll figure it out. It, you know, for us, it's, you know, our point of view, it's all about user engagement. And so as long as they focus on that, and, and I'm sure they are, they'll do fine. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I want to talk just a little bit about international. Um, you know, how is this stuff influencing how people are thinking about international? We don't have a lot of time, so maybe um, just the kind of quick and dirty of it. I know we talked about it a little bit backstage, right, um, in terms of just like the kinds of things that they should be looking at, say, if a company is in the US and expanding to China or vice versa, I guess. So a few things to keep in mind. So you know. When we were, so some of our customers have explicitly bought the data to inform their international expansion strategy. So it may be, for example, one of our customers who in their category is number one. And they were thinking, okay, the obvious place to expand, other English-speaking countries first, right? Makes that sort of transition pretty easy to, to localize the content. And what they realized is in one of the markets that was obvious to look at, the UK, the number one player there had 3x their share of what they had as a number one player in the US, as an example. So it was like, it, what does number two even mean there? Is that going to pay enough of the bills, or so should we prioritize a different geography? And then you get into being able to you know, optimize around you know, which keywords from a, sort of a, an ASO perspective, right? Which keywords do we need to use that it resonates really well in ge one geography, but we have to fine tune it differently in another? Um, and from our data, what we're seeing is in many ways the big guys are getting bigger. You know, publishers are continuing to buy smaller developers and smaller publishers in order to continue their growth and, and sort of global reach. So for example, when we looked across, let's say, the five biggest publishing markets, so US, China, Japan, South Korea, UK, what was really interesting in most of those markets from a revenue or monetization standpoint through store, um, year over year, from the first quarter of 2014 to the first quarter of 2015, what we saw is monetization actually grew in home markets. Now, this is the, the inverse of this, is the downloads during that same period actually as a percentage of share, a share of total downloads that they have. So the absolute number of downloads obviously went up, but the share in their domestic market went down. And so it means that they're doing a better job of engaging and monetizing in their home market where they've been longer, which is a good indication that there's a level of maturity coming into play that now they figured out how to sort of fine tune for monetization in their home market. And now it's a matter of, OK, so how do we optimize in these other geographies? With that, Japan we're out of time. Being the one Sorry. Of time, so. um, all right, thank you so much for joining us, guys. And it's always a pleasure. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thanks.